Well, first of all, I am absolutely thrilled that you're going to be teaching on Reflections Parallel, Matthew. I'm well, thank thrilled. You. I am thrilled too. I always and, love working with you. Yeah. I, I want to introduce the class to our audience, which is uh, what I'd like to chat with you about, a class on patriarchy. And this is the uh, obviously the first time we've ever had a subject like this. And, and I want to tell our audience that when um, the opportunity came to have you, my former graduate school professor, come to uh, CMED, that um, we, we said, you know, what would you like to teach? Because your vast scope from Meister Eckhart to patriarchy to, to creation spirituality to the vast archive of theology that you have available. And this is the subject you chose. So I'm going to start by asking what inspired this? <laughs> Good question. What inspired this is when I look at the overall picture today of the world and of our culture as an elder, I see the issue of the feminine and the masculine being so distorted and out of sync that instead of a healthy masculine, we have patriarchy, which is a verse, is a worldview, it's a philosophy of way of seeing the world that is based not on healthy masculinity, but on faux masculinity. You see it in Putin and what's happening in Ukraine, and you see it in a lot of the American political scene, and um, and you see it all over. And and you know, Adrian Rich defined. Uh, Patriarchy. She describes patriarchy as um, containing fatalistic self-hatred. And I see a lot of fatalistic self-hatred going around. The denial of climate change, for example, that's like a death sentence. That's suicide. It's, it's extinction of our species. This is what's going on. And we're hiding our heads in the sand in, in, in self-hatred and the hatred of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to come. It's, a, it's, it's appalling. And so dualism is a basis of patriarchy as Rosemary Luther teaches, and we can move beyond dualism. And this is what healthy feminism does, is what the mystics are all about. The wanting, as Julian Norris calls it, the wanting of us in nature, the wanting of us in God, the wanting of God in nature. Um, the mystics are, are geniuses at, at non-dualism. And, um, and Dorothy Sola, the great, um, Feminist theologian says that, that mysticism is the alternative. It's the real language of healthy feminism for yeah. this very reason. So I think we'll not survive as a species without getting the gender balance more in sync. And that means for both men and women, because women are walking around with a, a toxic masculinity inside of them. Many of them are, because that's what we breathe in our culture. And, and of course, men are too, but we're not condemned to this. Men can break out of patriarchy and, and give birth to a new understanding of masculinity. And women, of course, can get into their own healthy power as women. And this return of the goddess in our time uh, is a, a lead in for that for both women and men, because men have a feminine so, side to their soul as women have a masculine side to their soul. So we're all in this together. And when I wrote my book on the on sacred masculinity, ten, um, the hidden spiritual of men, ten metaphors to awaken the sacred masculine, my first response was an email from a woman. She said, "I have over two hundred books on the goddess in my home library, not a single book on the sacred masculine." And she said, "I I am raising two teenage boys." And she said, I didn't realize until I read your book how much suffering men have undergone because of patriarchy. Precisely. She said, this, open, this is the next chapter of feminism, that we, that we help our brothers and work on ourselves, too, to bring the sacred masculine in and to um, you know, exit this, uh, this patriarchal version of masculinity. And then one I, more story. Yeah. I, got, I met a, a Native American who had worked in a men's prison for 12 years, he came up to me at a conference after my book came out. He said, for 12 years, I've been looking for a book that would get men in prison to look inside. He said, men in prison don't want to look inside. They want to project on others. And um, I couldn't find anything until your book came along. Now we're talking about real things. He said, your book introduced 
to my prisoners, the, or it's just a beautiful phrase, the nobility they carry inside. I just love that, nobility inside. Men carry nobility, but they don't know it because the patriarchal culture has been using men as it has also been using women for its agendas, which are agendas of the reptilian brain, power over instead of passion with, compassion. Oh, man. I cannot tell you how much I think this message of the sacred masculine, which no one ever talks about. No one Let's ever talks talk. about that. We'll have fun talking about it. No, no <laughs> one. I mean, uh, I think, I, I honest to God think that the male energy is starving for some kind of recognition of their inner reverence, that in order to be a man, they don't have to grab a gun. They don't have to go to war. They don't have to be the warrior that somehow they can be fully men and, and fully sacred and full. That in fact, I, I, I honestly think that if you have to use a weapon, you can hear. You are the most powerless. Mm -hmm. that, that inner weaponry of the soul is the most advanced you can understand. Exactly. exactly. And you know, Hildegard of Bingen, mm -hmm. uh, this strong Renaissance woman in the 12th century and Benedict yeah. Nevis, she writes her sisters and said, and says, be strong, be a warrior, you know, and she, she writes emperors and popes and says, you, you are, <laughs> you're not paying attention to lady justice. This is Rana Bay evil. She wrote the emperor and said, man up, you're just acting like a baby because you're <laughs> not standing up for justice. And so she saw the connection between virtue, what you just called the inner strength and true manliness because the word veer is the latin word for man and it and it's in the word virtuous right up front the word virtue so this is what she's saying that true true manliness is this inner strength and that's what um you know that's what cultures around the world have taught when they're healthy the greeks certainly taught that they developed this whole idea of virtue as the the the, the path to excellence and the path to ethics and the path to community uh, justice and survival. That's exactly right. That the, 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 the actual weaponry is invisible. Power. Power is actually invisible. The highest power is invisible. What did, show me love. Show me creativity. Show me passion. Show me. You can't. These are the greatest powers we have. Show me forgiveness. These are the greatest powers that actually revitalize the human being. Exactly. And, and we can can't. point to models. You know, we can point to Dr. King or Gandhi or Jesus or Dorothy Day or, or whoever. We have models, but you, you're right. You, it, you can't see it. And you have to develop it within yeah. oneself and within one's culture. In other words, schooling and education has to be teaching uh, values like this. And it doesn't. That's why Einstein said, quote, I abhor American education, unquote, even though he was living on Princeton Princeton campus for for decades but then he tells us why because he said um, we've been given two gifts the gift of our rational mind and the gift of our intuitive mind but he said all of education in America is devoted to the rational mind but he said values don't come from the rational mind they come from the intuitive mind and the rational mind should serve the intuitive mind but in American education there is no intuitive mind that you, we pay all the attention to the rational mind. And so this, we're talking about values, these inner, inner powers within us. And, um, and these are going, we're, we're not getting educated. Like I see January 6th as a report card on American education. Right. When people right. revert to utter violence and folly and, and the rest, and, and that's not the human mind responding that's the reptilian brain response that's right that's right but you know if, if you if you look matt look at it the more frightened and disempowered a person becomes the more violent they become they have no other resources but to become violent because they intuitively it's their violent their violent intuition they know they have no other resources but to grab sticks and stones and, and AR-17, AR-15. And AR-15s. When they're they have, available like right. they are in our culture. For right. They have no other resources because they don't know how to reach for inspiration. They don't know how to access mystical tools. 
exactly. And they haven't had rites of passage. And this right. is especially dangerous with boys. Right. You don't have rite of passage. You, you succumb to violence and anger because you don't know your place. You don't feel you belong. And, yes. you're, and, uh, and the results are, are in the news every day, sad right. to say. Yeah, you don't have those passages, those sacred passages, those sacraments, those passages into manhood, acknowledged and mm -hmm. sanctified, that makes someone feel, I've come to this stage of empowerment. Exactly. I've come to this stage of empowerment. Exactly. And, and, and I, I'm convinced that's why they go around tattooing themselves, mm -hmm. self-acknowledging, self see, I have power. See, I'm writing it on myself, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, and, and the elders are absent. Out. The elders are so often absent. And that's part of a rite of passage. It's the elders who, who lead. Um, and they've been through it themselves. That's not true in our culture, because few elders in our culture have undergone rites of passage themselves. And so we have to regain this ground and very swiftly, uh, because our survival of our species depends on it. Well, this class <clears throat> will take the students through a journey into masculine and feminine power and into mysticism and into the role the mystics play in understanding how it is to become, what it means to become a fully whole person. Do you want to add your commentary here? Well, I fully agree with what you just said. Yes, what, what does it mean to be human? Uh, that's the bottom line, isn't it? And, and we're yeah. failing uh, as a species. Uh, I mean, science tells us we have seven years left mm -hmm. until if we can't turn this climate change around thing. But meanwhile, look, we're already preoccupied with war in Ukraine, in another war in Europe after 80 years. We thought that was behind us. And uh, of course, we've got a war against democracy happening in many countries, including our own. And we've got the, the rise of despair. And, and of course, meanwhile, the seas are rising, the droughts are, are here, uh, and, and flooding in some places, droughts in others. So, you know, things are not going well, and people feel it deeply, even if they can't articulate it. But humanity is amazingly resourceful, and we have this wisdom from our, our multiple religious traditions and spiritual traditions, including practices. And, and we have we have models in our, our stories um, that can uh, assist us to, to lead the way. So we will be calling on some of these um, ancient voices like Hildegard and Aquinas and Eckhart and Julian Norwich and others, even as we, we bring our souls into the 21st century. Uh, don't count our species out. We are extremely resilient. We have this gift of creativity that is our greatest gift. Unfortunately, it can be used to destroy as well as to build. And we want to, of course, apply it that way, as you say, to build up the inner life of, um, of one another and to shake up our institutions from religion to education to politics and economics to media, that they be part of the solution and not, and not part of the problem. I don't think we have any other work to do with our lives, Matthew but to inspire people to make a difference. That, that is so true. This That's is the role of elders. Tell That's the stories that save, mm -hmm. that heal. And whether they come from a Jewish tradition or a Buddhist tradition or a Christian tradition or a Muslim tradition or from atheism or humanism, to me, doesn't matter at all. Let's bring all our wisdom to the table because it's all hands on deck. Uh, you know, this is, is crunch time for, for our species. And remember this, this really puts it in context for me. We've now discovered 14 other hominid tribes, uh, cousins of ours, like the Neanderthal or the Denizen. Now we've discovered a dozen more in Southeast Asia. There are going to be more. But the bottom line is they're all gone. They're all extinct. We're the last hominid standing. Imagine that. We're the last hominid standing. I met with a, a, a renowned biologist at Stanford several years ago, and he said to me, you know, we're the first species on the planet in 450 years that can choose, 350 years, that can choose not to go extinct. But of course, he said, we haven't made that choice yet. 
at SA 250, you know, 4.5 billion years. But the point is, we haven't made the choice yet not to go extinct, and extinction is is right around the corner. So if this can't get us out of our couches, you know, and wake us up, well, you know, then then we, you know, then then we're we're moving on. The Earth is moving on without us. Yes. I want to thank Matthew for this wonderful uh, uh, exchange. We could have gone on forever. But you'll have a chance to be with him in this class. And I can't encourage you enough to take this wonderful course on patriarchy. I think uh, we've given you, um, I hope, wonderful reasons to want to join this. And speaking of, here are the details. July 11th, Monday and Wednesdays. The course will we're on Monday and Wednesdays. And it starts at 4 p.m. Pacific time, 6 central, 7 eastern. So, and all the details are on the site, mace.com. So take a look and register and uh, we'll see you then. Thank you, everybody.